Luca Nation. We're coming on the heels of probably our most commented, most liked, most listened to episode. And it's interesting because the set collecting conversation, you know, it's been a long time coming. Even Will, who, who's, you know, helps us with content and creative. Uh, he's been asking about that. So people, honestly, it's one of the episodes where people kind of left their own two cents at what they think set collecting is. So I urge you guys not only to listen to yesterday's episode, but even, you know, engage in the comments, have conversations in the comments. Uh, I think oftentimes you come to our show or come to our channel and want us to have a lot of the answers. But the truth is we learn from you guys just as much, or at least I do. So please keep those comments coming. I, I love it, man. It. I know our community appreciates it. I love it. I do, and we didn't even we didn't even do it justice. Like we we may even have to you know come back to it, and if the comments and the questions and all that other fun stuff you know warrant it, maybe we can address some of those comments and questions, some of the ideas you guys have already thrown into the YouTube comments, some of the questions you have, you know, and kind of formulate it. The funny thing is, um, you know. I found myself having a hard time explaining it. And what's, what was amazing is because Andrew and I, I think if you asked us to define set collectors, we would define it differently, right? And the questions, if you think about it, the questions that Andrew were asking were about like, why would I do this instead of just buying this, this, and this, right? And I'm like, nah, just collect the set. You know, you want to collect it and finish it. And it, 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 it definitely... We didn't do it justice. We didn't give it enough time. We will come back to it. So we love the commentary. We love the stuff. When you get a, a topic like that, the comments let you know that we should probably dive deeper in it. And the comments will help us do that. The questions you're asking will help us do that. So we'll do that. Enough. I have a topic for you. Sure. Do you, do you think real quick, you know how yeah. like your, your, your initial thesis was the more you have to talk about a card or an idea in the hobby, the, the more it's made up. Maybe set collecting is as pure as it gets because you don't even have words. You're speechless. So the reason, I mean, it's, it's a great question. Uh, you're very good at this. The reason why the less you have to talk about a card, the more comfortable I am buying it. That was talking about flipping. That was talking about buying a card that eventually you think is going to sell for more. Right? And um, I think set collectors, at base, at their heart, they're not doing that equation. They're not thinking to themselves, oh, wow, if I get this card... Am I going to be able to sell it for more? As a matter of fact, they're probably overpaying for those last bunch of cards in order to complete the set because there's a premium that they're going to put on set completion. There's a premium they're putting on. And and by the way, it's funny. It's not just the Pokemon. It's not just, you know, um, you know, crappy set. There are people who collect vintage baseball sets in the 70s, the 80s, who collect, you know, basketball sets in high grade and have registries and they compete with each other for who has this many of these in PSA 9. That's why you see 86 clear is a great example, right? That's why you see Johnny Moore sell for five figures, right? You wouldn't think that, like Johnny Moore. A base Johnny Moore is a couple bucks, but a Johnny Moore PSA 10 they sell it for a ton of money because people are trying to compete complete that set. There's only so many who can actually do it. So it's it's it really is just an interesting. You want to know my topic for you? Yeah. I really my topic do. for you is I love there's a lot of companies in the hobby. And I love there's a lot of companies that are coming in the hobby, companies staying in the hobby, and you know, companies here. There's a great line in the show Hamilton, where yeah. US, the United States, before they're the United States, um, you know, is trying to get their independence from Britain. And the king comes out and he's a great, you know, great part of the show. And he's like, you know, how dare you guys, you know, try to go away from me. I thought we had an arrangement. And now I'm fighting with France and with Spain. It's insane. And basically it's not a unified front. And it got right. me thinking, right, that you had France and Spain fighting with Britain, you know, needling them. And Britain didn't have the ability to also focus on what was the big issue at hand, which was the American insurrection, the American uprising. And because of it, they lost America, right? Whereas that was a huge thing for them for a long time, right? Is and that what's lost... happening with America now that G and Putin have met and said, look, we're, we're about to do something that hasn't been done in the last hundred years. And we're here fighting internal battles of how many letters and what possible. things we could teach to kids is that you're, you're going to bring it with the global you know global political landscape and you can use that i'm using it more of if hobby companies go too far away from their bailiwick 
and they lose sight of what they are best at. And they are trying to fight France and Spain at the same time as also keep their core customers. But they're also now trying to move into this and move into that. Do they, all, do they risk losing it all? Please. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? And you can go yeah. any company you like. You can go – because this happens – I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm rubber, you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off me, sticks to you. So you're gonna be the one answering this. Nice. But I have thoughts on it from just a structural perspective. So whether you like it, um, whether you're a fan of junk food, fast food, or not, what was interesting about McDonald's and the franchise model is they kind of spread fast food across America. Yep. The issue that we sh- we have in the hobby is there's no shortage of potatoes. There's no shortage of, of meat. There's no shortage of Coca-Cola, right? It's a infinite product, right? You could always grow more. The challenge with the hobby and why you always see battle lines drawn is it's a scarce resource. If I grade here, it automatically means I don't grade there. But if we go one step further, which is really the crux and where everything starts, it's there's only a finite amount of product. So we have to battle for that product. And that is the, I think, the the difference. Because yes, Burger King, Wendy's, uh, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, look how many, all of them survived and all of them actually thrived because the fast food industry grew, right? We didn't eat fast food. Believe it or not, Cage, the franchise that my dad bought was called Horn and Harder. That was the biggest company in the world at one point. And that was an automat. Where you'd come put in a nickel, get you know a coffee, you'd get a, a, a rice pudding, tapioca pudding. And then that we switched fast food from that to burgers and fries and shakes. But the point is it's infinite. Food was an infinite product. What's what's challenging about the hobby is if I oh, give the cows. They are actually infinite. <laughs> I, I know it's well, they're growing them now in petri dishes, so you might be yeah. righter than you realize. <laughs> but like with, with product, if I give product to you here, I want some kind of action for, uh, for you to take, or I'll not give you the product and I'll go give the product to somewhere else. And it's a challenging space. I don't know any other spaces that have uh, that kind of bottleneck. I mean, listen, that it's a that's a that's a, it's almost the same topic. And it's just as scary. To me, it's Oil. with the ever expanding hobby and with people coming in and people, you know, branching out. You know, if you're a card company, you know, when you try to branch out into memorabilia, do you alienate and stop taking as good a care of the people who are card people? Card you company, just, a card manufacturer specifically. Whatever it is. If it's card manufacturer, if you're an auction house, it, whatever it is, right? It, Use anyone, man. Use PWCC, right? We love PWCC, right? Is there danger in them expanding out to too many lines of businesses? And then, you know, the fear is that they kind of don't focus as much on the cards because they're focusing on building up all these other lines of, of, of you know, of assets. Do they have to do it because of so much competition in the space? I, I don't know what the right answer is, man. You know, what if PWCC um, said, you know, we have to compete. They noticed Golden's show coming out on Netflix and they said, you know what? Our content was just as good. Remember they did the, you know, the unvaulted, Top right? 100. They had, they, well, they did that too. Oh, right. but they also had like in the vault where they were doing the, you know, yeah. these cards and all that stuff, which I kind of miss. It was good stuff. But, you know, but now, now they're, they're trying to do coins they're trying to do, you know, comics. They're trying to build content. They're fighting with France. They're fighting with Spain. And, and America is off on their own over here saying, wait, what about me? You know, like you used to be the best at cards and that was all. And you only cared about me. And now you're out there, you know, with scantily clad Pokemon content creators. And, you know, what's going on? Is there a danger? I use PWCC, guys. I'm not saying this is – I'm just trying to, uh, you know, trying to – A danger to whom? Here, to a do. danger to whom? To the company, to the hobby as a whole, is there? No, because game? I bet if you looked at their books, forgetting the overhead of of hiring all the people, they're making so more money. They have more revenue. Because do you run the risk of the people who were loyal to your brand in the beginning? You're now no longer dedicating the resources to them that you were because your resources are spread out all over the place. No. 
And Peter Basizi, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just you were an easy, easy you, could, you could use anyone. I don't doing a Netflix show, and it you know, doesn't feel good. But I'm not so sure that it has business implications because for them, they already have acquired those customers. They've taken care of them. They're in the mindset of new customer acquisition, right? They yes. think that the the hobby participation pie has grown, and they're only tapping into a small percentage of it. So maybe they'll alienate a few of that small percentage, but they're going to. So you hit to, me. So you got exactly I did, I did where I wanted you to go with sure. this topic. hundred percent. For the record, people on the internet are a little bit crazy. So they heard hit, they might run with that. I did not hit him in any way, shape, or form. So don't go too far from this, right? So you're exactly right. It's it's it is old customers versus trying to expand and getting new customers, right? So I'm going to spin this, and what I want you to have in your brain is Verizon's commercials. Oh, right? right, you know, or AT and T, right? The woman with the and there's a guy with the blackboard, and people walk in the store, and it's like, hey, wow, what a great offer for new customers! And then a woman walks in and says, whoa, what about your old customers? And he turns the board around, same deal for the old customers. Oh, what about new customers? And he's oh, and he's like out of breath, and he's turning the blackboard around. So it's the don't worry if you're a new customer, yep. you're getting this great deal. But hey, old customers, we're not screwing you over. They they have to advertise for that because for the past couple of years they have been screwing over. Their legacy people in exchange for new ones. My, yes. my Verizon bill just went up. They raised every line a couple of dollars because my plan is so good that they want me to change over and like become a new right. customer. And it, yeah. you know, if you go to T Mobile, they'll give you a new phone for new customers and, and always new customers. It's often a better deal to change to a competitor than to stay with the company, which is so. For our so cards. backwards, it feels. I love that Fanatics is coming in. I think Fanatics is going to do a lot of great stuff for the hobby. I think Fanatics is going to do all kinds of great growth and you name it. But, but, I'll use Fanatics now because I picked up PWCC. Sorry, guys. I love you. It wasn't you. It was just using you as an example. And Fanatics, I'm just using you as an example also. Do they go too far towards the, we have to bring in new people and run the risk of alienating the whole reason they came in. Obviously, they spent this money, they bought the licenses because of what existed, because of the fan base, the collector base, the rabid you know, um, enthusiasm for it. And I'm sure no matter what they do, there are some collectors who are always going to collect. But does a company like Fanatics changing so much of it and really, you know, ramping up the product, you know, producing more and really only focusing on, and I'm, I'm speaking from that upstream here. and capturing more, uh, to justify more their investment, the to justify the amount of money they spent, they have to bring more people in, which let's pause for a second. I'm assuming they're going to be successful at, and that's a good thing for everyone in the hobby. We need to define success. I think that I, I really have people. thoughts on this. So I think it's I'll a, shut up. Let's hear your thoughts because I think it's a good I topic think, and no one's talking about it. I think it's a structural issue of what capitalism has become. So what capitalism what does it what is the role of government really if you kind of like just backpedal 200 years? It was to incentivize people to start businesses and those businesses would then take care of their communities. And that was real communities in person like Bob the Butcher and you know Gary, the great, the great maker. And, uh, you know, you, you guys all down the road, you know, th there was these local communities where every small business supported each other and the community kind of helped, helped each other afloat. We have this digital, these digital communities, but I think what has happened with this friction between media saying like rich is bad, business is bad, you know, they should pay their taxes. Look at how much, how little these billionaires pay, right? So the billionaires are like, screw you guys. We actually pay a ton of taxes and we hire all these people. We have all these people working for us. The trickle down effect. So there's that. There's the friction between government media narrative and the rich. And then there's the incentives, right? So it's like, I think if you ask most conservatives, they'd say government should just get out of the way and let businesses do what businesses do. I think businesses right now are struggling so much that they have to only look out for their own interests. They don't have any overflow. They don't have excess to feel like, okay, I could get mine, but I could also make sure that the general commute, I'm not putting Bob the butcher out of business. I'm not putting Gary, the grapeseed maker out of out of business. That's what a true capitalistic society. If you go back to founding fathers and what we were about two, 300 years ago, and I think the narrative has changed. I really think so. I think 
you know, even we look at a book Gary V wrote, right? Yeah, and yeah, I, I use, I, yeah, I'll say you use Gary V because truthfully, there are poster children for different things. And, you know, so if you think of R&B, you think of Usher, for example, you think uh, hip hop, you think Dr. Dre Snoop, Dr. Dre Snoop Dogg and Eminem. Hypothetically, someone could think of something. <laughs> right now, the poster child for uh, business is Gary V, right? And he writes this bad economy. You got a band like, for Gary V. It's an Usher song. Oh, you got it. Uh, you got it. You got it. Bad. That one. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it, it going. Nineties R and B man is Hang so. Hang up so... and you call right back. Come on. I think the poster Next children, one. Michael Rubin, Gary. I, I think. I don't think that their actions have actually shown that they care too much about the community, even though. When Gary wrote the book Thank You Economy, he talks about Bob the Butcher. He talks about taking care of the community. I think, it's called I think right now we've seen a lot of grift, a lot yeah. of people coming in, taking theirs, and leaving scraps for like, take the rest. It's not a symbiotic relationship. It's not an, an uh, ecosystem where I thrive and you guys thrive. And I don't know if that's the internet, if this is the wild, wild west of the digital world. I don't know the reasons, but that's how... I have observed it. So I guess my take on it is this, right? You often ask me when we close a segment like this, I'm the CEO of the hobby or I'm the CEO of Fanatics. What do I do, right? First of all, I would do a lot of cool stuff. But beyond that, right? I would ask one question before that is what are you incentivized to do first? I remember what it was that made me want to invest in this space to begin with. And it's probably a combination of two things, not just one. Obviously saw that there was a way to really blow it up and make it profitable. Otherwise, you don't spend that money. You don't invest the billions of dollars that were invested in license unless you thought it was worth more. So clearly, bringing more people in, making it worth more. But the other part is it was thriving. If we didn't have the boom, if we didn't have the collectors, if we didn't have the people, the businesses, the folks in this hobby who were, who were making it thriving and building it up – probably wouldn't have even caught the attention of fanatics when it did with the value that it did. And if I'm sitting there at, you know, fanatics and I have all of these, you know, big time hobby people trying to be my friend and everybody wanting to get in line with fanatics and be a, a friend of fanatics and blah, blah, blah. I would I use that. To get all of them. But, uh, but like they it? shouldn't, right? What I would say is, and they probably are laughing at them, but you know, maybe they're not, right? Because I will say, and I've said this now, I did not jump all over Michael Rubin. I didn't film it. I did not, you know, make a big display out of it. But I did get to talk to him in Philly. And I was impressed about how he realized he was talking to someone, not me, but Joe who runs the show, that, that he was talking to someone who knew what he was talking about. And he listened. He let Joe talk. He let Joe introduce him to people. And he listened. That was an impressive thing to me because sometimes the smartest person in the room it's not the one who's the talking the most. It's, it's a skill I need to learn sometimes. Sometimes it's the one who sits there and listens and lets other people talk. You can learn. Sometimes the smartest person in the room is the quietest. But what's amazing about it is if I were, you know, in a, a decision-making role at Fanatics, what I would turn around and say, I would be trying to find a balance between bringing in new people, but at the same time, trying to take care of the people that made it a space that I wanted to be in to begin with. And I might even try to get those folks involved in how I expand to new folks. Because I think what we're going to find, and I know I'm not alone in, in saying this, I think what you're going to find is it's not as easy to create new collectors as it is to keep your old ones pretty hard to kill off the lunatic collectors that you have they'll take a bunch of punches to the face they'll take a bunch of kicks they've they've been here they've been through thick and thin and i think if you if you if you spend one tenth of the energy reinforcing the base that you have and going to them for ideas focus grouping them on hey guys you have to know we're looking to expand we're looking to bring new people in we have our ideas of how to do that but you've been here you were the ones who created the space and took it here. You took it from one to 10. We want to take it from 10 to 50. Work with us. How would you do it? What would you change? What do you think would bring new people in, but at the same time, keep you happy? 
instead of one going alone, two laughing at those people, or three, the most important one, taking them for granted. Because I think that's what happens often. When you have these expansions, when you have these things where companies pivot, where companies go and, and they say, all right, we're, you know, we're going to do more this year than has been done ever, blah, blah, you take for granted what, what I think is your, 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 you know, your, your best base, your best support. So that's what I would do if I were the you know, CEO. I totally or agree. Or whatever. I would say that's the effect. I would say the cause. What phone do you have? You have an iPhone? iPhone 8. iPhone 8. Old. What, what do you think? What percentage of Americans own iPhones? If I had to guess, probably 70% who are phone owners, maybe more of phone owners. Okay. I, uh, I don't know. You know I know of other yeah. Americans, like, you know, a lot of people don't own a phone, but. So, um, planes, Boeing, Airbus, mm-hmm. two companies. Two yeah. Companies. Plane innovation. Have you enjoyed your flying experience more or less than 50 years ago? Uh, less. They used to they used to serve you full out dinners. I mean, plus. you have you to have pay to just, for everything more now. Yeah, it's it's it. They haven't really innovated shove, it that much. They haven't innovated. You have to shove Some a bag. Some still have ashtrays in the in the hand yeah. rests, and you haven't, you haven't been able to smoke it on a plane in forty years. So yeah, not what's much happening right. with banks right now? They're putting out local and regional banks. The customer service. The hey, I'm going to fund Joe Schmo, the plumber, so he can start his business, live his dream, to roll up to the big banks. And there's this. Quote from a movie, one of my favorite movies, Katano says it from American Gangsters. He says, monopolies are illegal in this country, Frank, because no one can compete with a monopoly. If they let dairy farmers do that, half of them would go out of business tomorrow. And Frank laughs. He's like, Frank Lucas, he's like, I'm just trying to make a living. And he says, that's your right, because this is America, but not at the unreasonable expense of others. That's un-American. And there's something to that. And I think that the way that the last 50 biz- years of business in America, forget the industry, industry agnostic, is I think we've been pushing more companies towards being monopolies, towards gobbling up market share. And when you create monopolies, by default, they have no competition. By definition, they don't have to compete on service or price or offering or better value. And that is my biggest concern, especially in an unregulated space like this. That's how I would sum it up. I would say that they're behaving and they will behave in character because history does leave clues. It's the structure. It's the lack of competition. It's vertically integrating and basically controlling the entire space it makes it really challenging. American Gangster, who would have thought, right? What a good movie, man. Because what he did, he's completely squashes Samsung. Apple has no incentive to make your phone any better going forward. So they actually, yeah. And not only that, I just lived it. I don't know if any of you guys got the Air uh, AirPod Pros, which was a far inferior product (laughs) to that and the AirPod One. It's a terrible product, Cage, in the sense like I touch it and it drops a call. Who would have thought that that's a that's a good feature. Like you can't skip songs anymore. So it's a, uh, it's not just happening in our space. It's very concerning because what you don't want to see is Joe who built a business, who trades on quality, who trades on service. I don't want to put those guys out of business. Didn't McDonald's put people out of business though, just to really play the other side of the equation. Weren't there a lot of mom and pop, you know, places that were put out of business by, you know, what some would say is now, you know, an American staple. So yeah. I mean, fl- playing the other side, couldn't McDonald's and, you know, that company now turn around and say, well, you know, you innovate, you know, you innovate, you make change or you die. And, you know, another company coming in like Fanatics would say, you know, we're going to do this better than anybody else. And, you know, we don't owe anyone anything. Yeah. Yeah. No? McDonald's did become uh, huge, but I don't think they became they, – they started as a small business. They grew – and I don't know the history, so I don't want to speak to it. But, yeah, in a lot of ways they did. But I don't think that they're a monopoly because there are – Wendy's could come in. Burger King could come in. Chick-fil-A could come in. Taco Bell could come in. Chipotle could come in. All right. I, I hear you. I definitely do. Listen, for me, to not to be the most overused cliche in the hobby, I woke up this morning thinking about this topic because – I love all of the companies we have in the hobby. I love them all. I love all of them. And you know, not just the ones that we work with, right? But 
I think we get a better product because there are five or 12 auction houses that we can go to. I think we get a better product with less fees, you know, and more usability because there are a bunch of different live selling platforms that are trying to figure that out. You know, I think that, you know, you get, um, you know, better quality product because there are more than one company making the sports cards, you know, and there was the in cliche, the 90s page. Well, the, the, and yeah, I mean, but the cliche that I have is, what are you what know, is it from collect now? I would love it if we as a hobby realized that maybe when Fanatics comes in, we actually will get that growing pie that we talked about. And maybe if the space and the companies in the space work together, we could all get a piece of that bigger pie instead of everybody just fighting and you know the pie staying smaller. I, it's like I said, cliche, yeah, right? Not. But a million trillion percent, man. I mean, think about the era right now, and we'll bounce with this. The era of the most card manufacturers was late 80s, early 90s. We yeah. call it the junk era, but it's just actually not. It's the era of the cards that are sought after today. PFGs, yeah. rubies. People had to Tiffany. really innovate, right? Yeah. They came up with the, the scoring kings, the shiny stuff, adding in autographs in, in packs, adding in relics in packs, adding in autographs and relics in packs coming up with redemptions, which I know people hate, but you know, it was an innovation, right. Of how to get people something what they couldn't get it at the time of the product release. The, you know, your PMGs, your shiny cards, your chromium cards, your refractors, your numbered cards, right? Yeah. All that stuff came from, I believe more competition in the space. So it actually does better the product over time. So anyway, I'd love to hear what you guys think about this. With nearly 40 years as the most trusted resource for collectors, dating back to the first Beckett magazine in 1984, Beckett has been the brand that bridges generations of the hobby. We're happy to be partnering with Beckett and look forward to keeping you all updated on the big things happening at the company in 2023. Beckett, it's the name you know and the name you can trust.